All right, now I'm recording. My apologies. Um, we're gonna, so finding the fields uh, in the box on the left. So let's start off with B is the curl of A. Right, so A is this thing that points just in the Z direction, only within a cylinder that's width expands as time passes, and it's expanding uh, at, at the speed of light. Um, so the curl of A, all right, well, we can look up the curl in cylindrical coordinates and, and so on. We're going to get nothing. The S hat direction um, will take derivative of the S component. Well, there is no S component, nothing right there. Take the derivative of the Z component with respect to S, right? And that will be in the phi hat direction. And then, oh, and, and over here we had this because there was no phi or z variation. Uh, and then uh, over here, nothing for the other component, right? We're, so go ahead and we can take the derivative with respect to s of what's going on uh, uh, of the expression there. So. Got all of this right there. Pick up the minus sign, right? Uh, take the derivative of this, and we get one over it. So s like that, and then we have to take the derivative uh, of the argument. We would get minus c t over s squared right, from the chain rule. And again, this is all in the phi hat direction. Uh, so a bunch of that cancels out, and we're left with um, 2 pi s in the phi hat direction when s is less than c times t, right? And it's 0 when s is side that. Does that expression look familiar? Forget about the piecewise uh, aspect of it. Yeah, this is the same as if we had a line of current or a cylindrically symmetric thing, but only within the region that can be reached at the speed of light. Outside of that, there's nothing, right? Now let's take a look at the electric field. Um, right, so we've got zero because there's no, no uh, scalar potential. And then minus dA dt there, right? And so there's a temporal component to this. So minus mu naught i over 2 pi s. Again, we take 1 over the argument of the natural log. And then we take the time derivative of this. So we're going to get cs, right, from the chain rule. And that was in the z hat direction. Still, because right, it's just the time derivative of that, so we get uh, minus mu naught i uh, over two pi t. Right, the s is canceled. The one thing that hasn't canceled is the t. And that's in the z hat direction again, and that's for within the area the accessible region right there. And this is for S greater than CT, right? The first part was for S less than CT. Um, so yeah, we've got the field like we have just for a wire, but it's expanding out the region. So we've got a, oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. We've got this cylindrical region where you've got the field of a wire and that region is expanding out at the speed of light, right? Um, basically, what's happened is, right, this is what you would see if we have zero current through your wire, and then at t equals zero, you flip a switch. And now, all of a sudden, you've got um, uh, current I flowing in the wire, so that creates a field. But the news that, there's, that there is, you know, the causal... Uh, effect uh, that there is current in those wire in the wire will only expand outwards at CT, right? And so 
outwards, outwards, the field expands outwards, and at the same time, right? So if you've got a changing magnetic field, you're going to get a um, an electric field too, and that's what this E uh, is, and that has to again the, can't, the news the causal effect can't propagate faster than the speed of light, so it travels outwards at C. Um, notice that right at t equals zero is going to be infinite, right? Because in, in fact, right, we've taken our charge and instead of accelerating it, we've gone, you know, gradually we've gone from not moving to fully moving with current i, right? So that means that there had to have been initially for that instant of time an infinite electric field, right? That one over t equals zero, and then the field can can get weaker as time. Uh, passes, right? There's less change of that. Okay, so one of the things we can see right here is we can already start to build in the effects of special relativity. And we're going to have this. And so even though this isn't our regular kind of propagating wave, right, we can see a propagation of effects outwards too. Crazy? Let's, so that's just like an example. Okay, we can still use these, do some of the same kinds of things we used to be able to do. Um, let me just save this image, um, and then we'll actually take a look at, at some of the implications of all this. Okay, um, so those these Poisson type equations right here, um, they're not very simple, um, but the one advantage of them over working with the fields is we've got one scalar potential and one vector field instead of like when you're working with a field, I'm sorry, one scalar potential and one vector potential. So that's like four components instead of E and B, in which case you've got two vector fields, right? So here you only have one vector, one scalar to deal with. So that's nice. Um, that's the first part, first advantage. The other thing is, right, the only thing that matters to us is the forces, which is the fields. Um, and because our potentials determine the fields with derivatives, that means the potentials aren't uniquely de determined, right? So we've got some freedom in choosing our potentials. And in fact, we can s make choices that set them up so that um, the, the potentials or the Poisson type equations, something about them, um, we can make it, uh, we can choose to simplify various aspects. Usually you pay a price by making some other part a little more complicated or, or at least retaining the complexity. But we've got, with the freedom to make choices, uh, we can uh, keep things relatively, uh, we can simplify various aspects of it. So here, let's, um, oops. Um, so in particular, this, uh, they're not, why are they not uniquely determined? It's uh, many V and A give the same. E and B and E and B are what determines the force is the things that actually matter, the things we can observe, right? And so this uh, freedom to choose is called gauge freedom. <clears throat> so, right, the 
gauge refers to the fact that we have these extra degrees of freedom that aren't physically relevant. And so we can, we can, um, and, and they, but the fact that they are present can in fact inform symmetries of, of uh, our fields. Um, so here, let's write the one again, um, just to recap. So B is the curl of A. And E, our electric field, is the negative gradient of E minus dA dt as well. That's a new part, right? So <clears throat> question, yeah, Nick. Uh, I'm still confused about um, your on and off switch with the wired sample. Um, okay. when, when you create a, an electric field, is that propagating like a wave with, with speed? Ah. speed? So the presence of the field propagates outwards, but the field is also dying off with time. So you get this big pulse that is basically like a delta function in the location of the wire initially, and then it spreads out, but also decreases in time, with time. So it, the location of the electric field gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but the magnitude of the electric field gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so you'd say it's something unique to a wave. It's not a wave. So it's it's not like a a, a wave in the sense that so it, it, this is going to attenuate as as time passes, right? So the um it's not something a, a wave in the sense that it um continues, you know, indefinitely. Here it's going to die off as time passes, and you're going to be left with just eventually you're going to be left with a constant magnetic field that fills all space just like just from a st steady uh, uh, current. So it, it depends what you mean by a wave, but it's, it's not a continuous wave. It has discontinuities and it and eventually die, dies out. Okay, cool. Good, good, good. All right, so back with our potentials here as we watch them. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, make my life easier. As we as we're looking at these potentials right here, um, uh, we saw before, right, with our electric potential in electrostatics, right, you could add a constant onto it because just taking the gradient, right, you take a, add a constant onto it doesn't change anything right here. Um, we can do something similar right here. So let's look at two different uh, uh, vector potentials, for example, right. Um, and let's, so we're going to call it A, and we'll call the other one A prime, right? And we touched on this a little bit when we were, when we were reviewing magnetic fields, um, that both, if they both give the same magnetic field, right? So what, what can be different between them? Well, we can add on, well, of course we can add on a constant, but that's kind of boring. We can add on actually any function, let's call it alpha. So these are vector fields, right? Um, that is a gradient because the curl of a gradient is zero, right? Oops, can differ by. Right? And that's because, again, the curl of a gradient is zero. Injectivity, oh my goodness. Um, I'm not, I would have to review the definitions and the terminology, yes. Uh, we are going to get very much into what right, we're talking about. So you can have multiple, right, we've got multiple functions that map onto uh, the same function, right? So is, is that where you're getting at? We're going to get also into um, elements of abstract algebra coming up to, at the end of the class too. It is way cool. Um, okay, so all right, so let's see something else. Um, so and 
that's a function. It's like linear. Are we talking about like basically mapping within our group? Yeah. Right. So this isn't one. To, right. And so taking a derivative is not a one to one operation. Right. It's a many to one. Yep. Um, do, do, do. All right. And so alpha right is, is a function. Um, we can let's see what can we add on to V. We could add a function on and it doesn't even have to be constant. It can vary in time, right? Um, v and V prime, right? They're going to differ by beta, right? So if we're going to get the same electric field, um, well, it doesn't just depend on V. It depends on V and A. And so that means that the gradient of beta, right, beta is a function, you know, um, uh, plus, uh, I'm canceling on an overall minus sign, the time derivative of alpha, right, that's the added part onto a prime have to be equal to zero. So what that is saying is that the gradient of beta, whoops, that's a beta, plus d dt of the gradient of lambda has to be equal to zero. Uh, let's pull, let's again, common technique, we're gonna swap the order of our gradient and time derivatives because they commute. Right, and so, hey, we're taking the gradient of both functions and then adding them. So we could do that inside our gradient because it distributes. It's a linear function. Whoa, that's a time derivative. All right. Okay, and so um, what do we do now? We can integrate this spatially. Right, and so when you integrate, you um, get rid of the derivative, but you're also gonna pick up a constant. In this case, we're integrating spatially, so it has to be constant in space, but it can still vary in time. that you take the derivative of a function uh, of only time, you take the gradient of that and you get zero, right? So <clears throat> what we have right here is you integrate them and you get beta plus d lambda dt plus some constant, let's call that k, I guess for constant. Um, well, that's equal to zero. Right. Um, oh, you know what? But that k, right? We could just absorb that into a lambda, right? It's still just a function of time. Lambda is a function uh, that includes uh, being a function of time. because it stands for constant. Because we, because C is so special to us, we don't want to abuse C, overuse C. So we're going to overuse something that's not so special. Um, I don't know. I'm just stuck with uh, with what history has provided us. Um, so yeah, and doing this means it doesn't, if it's a function of just time, it doesn't affect 
the gradient of lambda and hence that extra beta that we added on. Oh, hence, I'm sorry, hence B is what I meant. That's what I was talking about, I'm misreading my notes, hence B. Cool. Um, so, all right, if once we do that, then uh, kind of run out of space. Happy with me. K? Why? I don't get it. All right, so we absorbed the K, so now we've got beta. Uh, is equal to minus d lambda dt, right? From the equation down below on the lower left, once we absorbed k, right? Um, so now we've got a relationship between the two quantities we've added in. Um, all right, so what is the conclusion from this? So if we have v and a, um, oh, I see, I am out of it. I'm too old. I still type out full sentences with periods, which I know indicates I'm rude uh, and angry. I know. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Oh, so this is the same, right? as having together, we might have an A prime, right, which is A plus the gradient of lambda, like we said, right? <clears throat> and we've got a V prime, which is V, we have to do minus D lambda DT, right? Because we said it was V plus beta, but beta was equal to minus D lambda DT. So we can make changes like this um, so long as we obey these constraints in lambda. Right, this is called gauge freedom again. Gauge freedom. Cool. All right. So the first thing what we're going to do now is explore different choices we can make with our with how lambda is going to play out and what they all mean and what they're useful for and how then this same kind of thing uh, works in things like particle physics. Second. All right, so let's do our first choice right here. Um, let's make a set, so a common choice we can use is called the Coulomb gauge. It's actually, without telling you this, it's where, what we've been working with all along. And in the Coulomb gauge, we choose that lambda such that the divergence of A is equal to zero. We don't even have to refer to, uh, <clears throat> to to lambda. We can just say, hey, you know, divergence of A is always equal to zero, and it, it, and and that is al allowable because of the freedom to choose a lambda. And so, um, if you go back and look at at uh, chapter five, it's talking about. Uh, when, when when the vector potential is introduced, it, we just say, okay, B is equal to curl of A, and then at some point Griffith says, hey, let's make things simpler by choosing um, the divergence of A to be equal to zero, right? But we didn't actually have to. It just that this is one choice that can make things simpler. 
right? And so, all right, let's look at our Poisson type equation, right? Um, time derivative of the divergence of A equals minus rho over epsilon. Oh, but that right there, right? That's zero, right? And so we do that and we recover our Poisson equation. Woohoo! All right. Um, there still might be some, uh, there's still some freedom to choose our potentials, right? We, we've said the divergence of A is equal to zero. Um, we haven't actually specified lambda itself. So one of the things though is let's see what the effect of making of, of the remaining gauge freedom um, is going to be. So if we've got V prime is equal to V uh, plus, so we'll call it some function, right, of R and T. Then the V prime can't, changing from V to V prime can't change our, you know, has to produce the same uh, charge density. So that means in order for that to happen, adding on this F can't change the Laplacian of our V, you know, V, v to V prime. So the Laplacian of F has to be equal to zero, right? Okay. Um, and typically, right, Um, we want to have our potential go to zero far away. It would be kind of uh, kind of weird if you could have something infinitely far away and still determine its uh, So um, we would say V goes to zero as R goes to infinity. And what that means then is that that if that's true for V, it's also going to be true for V prime. So that means that F of R and T, uh, but right, we've specified now this thing fully uh, because we've given the boundaries and we know that, that 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 we've got Laplacian of F is zero um, and it's zero at the boundaries of all space, right? Without having some something like a row there that's contributing to F the way it might contribute to V, um, that the Laplace's equation tells us we can't have a local uh, max or minimum, right? And so what that tells us then overall is that if it's zero on the boundaries and you can't have anything that's above or below zero, that means that the function itself has to be zero everywhere. <laughs> so we don't actually have the freedom to add that in. So we've specified the, this um, completely. So no more freedom. So we call this complete, right? We say that the divergence of A is equal to zero and we cannot vary V. So what is, yeah. Um, 
So a few things, right? Um, we worked with in the Coulomb gauge before. So we said, we saw that when the Laplacian of V is equal to minus rho over epsilon naught, and the potential goes to zero, well, here I'll say goes to zero, at R goes to infinity. Then we're able to write V out specifically relating it to our potentials. I mean, our sources. Four pi epsilon integral rho R prime. Uh, I'm going to clean that up. My apologies. That is. This is the position, and it's the source, so we're giving it a prime to indicate it's not the position of our point of interest. It can vary with time, um, and this is over R like this, d tau prime. Right? We're going to integrate that over our space. Yeah, nice and simple. Right? It's what we learned, right? Um, the nice, one of the nice things is, so remember in the example we were doing, right, what happened with our fields varied, right? If you flipped on the switch for the current on the wire, if you were farther away than C times T at which the switch got flipped, no knowledge of it going on. And this is, so you have to wait for that time delay, that relativistic time delay. Here though, this potential V depends on R, not at some like delayed time, but it, it depends on R and the, I'm sorry, depends on rho right at that time that you're looking for the potential, right? right. So it's nice and simple, particularly. Yeah, it just depends on T. We don't have to do any kind of relativistic. Um, we don't have to. We don't have to do any kind of relativistic lag, right? It is. You it depends on the state of the universe right now. Um, we'll talk about this. The instantaneous row, um, right? That's for our V, right? Um, so even outside the light cone. But the light cone are regions that could have been causally affected. They're within a distance CT uh, of our event. Ah, but right, there's a one over R, so we we just have to know it locally, right? It drops off. We can ignore very far away, right? That seems to violate relativity, right? I'm going to say, but. Right, E also depends on A, right? Because there's the minus DADT term, um, and that isn't instantaneous. So relativity is still very much at play. All right. So uh yeah i just have a little tiny bit right here um we'll keep going so the simplicity in v though is offset there's no such thing as a free lunch Right. Um, we still have the Poisson type equation for it. So here, I'm going to write this, and you don't have to do it all. Minus mu naught epsilon naught d squared a dt squared. Um, here we'll keep the we'll switch over, move the cross derivatives over to this side. Um, 
Luckily, we don't have any divergence of A. That term went away, but we still have a gradient of the time derivative. I mean, this was so complicated, I ran out of space. That was a dv dt, right? Ugh. Right? So you want to see what that leads to. <laughs> That's a da dt. d squared a dt squared, sorry. d squared a dt squared. It's not important. It's it's ugly is what is important. That's an epsilon naught, right? So here, let's write down. Uh, I'm not going to have enough space for this. Here, I'm going to write it. It's in the book. It is complicated. That's the takeaway. Oops, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. I'm starting to copy the previous one. Here, let's write down. That is the differential equation, the actual uh, definition here. I'm going to give myself a little more space, be extra sloppy. Again, you do not need to know this. You just need to know that it exists and that it's complicated. Um, it is the curl of the integral over space and time, but where time Right, we go out to separations times given by the separation converted into a time dt prime t prime j. Oh, I'm sorry, r prime t sub r prime. Ah, cross R hat all over R squared. Where? That T sub R is what we call the retarded time. It is the time, but we have to go backwards by any time that would be required to go at the speed, to travel at the speed of light. R rho sub c. I, I was, oh, what was the question again? Du, du. That's not PC. No, it, it, this it means literally delayed. Yes, that is what the, the terminology where you're using. It is slowed down. Right? So this is the script R over C is we're back, we're re reducing the time t by the amount that uh, of time that would be required to travel for at the speed of light from the source to where we are right basically as we look at things farther away we're look we have to look at the, at events farther back in time right it's like looking at, like in astronomy where you look at stars far away you're seeing them as they were you know their distance divided by c time ago right so where do we use all this right here um Um, in chemistry, like where you have to calculate what's going on, um, due to the, you know, the, the electron charges and the nuclear charges, it's also used in condensed matter. So again, studying electrons inside of materials and their electrical and other types of properties. Do you need to have that memorized? No, just be aware that these things exist, that these freedoms exist, that some parts and what they're chosen, so you make some parts simple, but that always leads to something else being kind of a pain. All right, that was one gauge. Let's look at another gauge. Uh, 
what is condensed matter? Condensed matter is looking at um, solids and liquids and the behaviors of uh, of them. So it, it's sometimes called solid state, but doesn't but it doesn't actually have to be solid state. So all this stuff about semiconductors and and uh, uh, superconductivity and all that stuff. Cool. Collective behaviors. We're not tracking individual things. Solid, solid state drives, right? You don't have anything. They're called, in that case, yeah, you've got a bunch of semiconductors and um, you don't have things moving around. Um, that's for the advantage of solid states. So, yeah, purely semiconductors, nothing mechanical about them. Let's look at another gauge. So, yeah. Uh, condensed matter is one of the big, one of the major areas of research in physics, like the major fields. You can divide physics up into high energy or particle physics, nuclear physics, uh, you know, uh, general relativity, um, atomic physics, condenser. There, you know, there are other ways to divide it too, but those are kind of the big, big, big ones. Um, so in the Lorentz gauge, right, we're going to choose it so that the divergence of A is not equal to zero, but it's specifically equal to mu naught, epsilon naught, dv dt. All right, so here's our Lorentz gauge. Um, so, all right, now let's write down uh, our Poisson type equation. Minus. U naught, epsilon naught. If you have these memorized, which you probably don't, but you can see where this one's going, <laughs> um, minus the gradient of uh, the divergence of A plus mu naught, epsilon naught, dv dt. Right? And that was equal to minus mu naught j. Right? And so, this whole thing, though, right, we have just chosen our potential so that we get that, right? There. Ooh, this is going to be, this is where things get cool. All right. I, I can just write this. Laplacian of A minus mu naught epsilon naught, second der time derivative of A equals minus mu naught J. Cool. And you've, once you've got that, wow, that looks a lot like our other equation. Our, our other Poisson type equation. So it's really, really parallel to it. Parallels, that one right there. So, and in fact, right, we're basically doing the same thing to the two different potentials, right? We're taking a Laplacian minus one over mu naught epsilon naught, right? And so instead of using the Laplacian, right, with this other second derivative, we're going to come up with a new operator, right? Remember, the Laplacian was really second derivative with respect to x plus second derivative with respect to y plus second derivative with respect to z. So here we've got all the three minus mu naught epsilon naught second derivative with respect to t. So let's just define a new operator, the D'Alembertian. So instead of our upside down triangle, let's make it a square. Yes, another French guy, right? We're talking about 18th century. Uh, yeah. Um, so here, right, it is our Laplacian minus mu naught epsilon naught second time derivative. Right? And so then these things can be written really nicely and simply, right? The D'Alembertian of V is minus one over epsilon naught rho, and the D'Alembertian of A is minus mu naught J. Whew. That 
That looks really simple. Right. The better, it's a square. You can draw a square, right? Um, you all were complaining, at least we didn't call it K, right? It's a square. Um, so, oh, in fact, all right, let's, let's rewrite this thing right here. <laughs> That's supposed to be a square, right? Are my Dellenbers in, right? Which was this thing right here. Oh, mu naught epsilon naught. It's hip to be. Mu naught epsilon naught, that is one over C squared, right? Because C is one over the square root of that product. So this is one, don't. <laughs> uh, right? And so I'm going to do, what we're going to do is, in fact, we can rewrite this right here. Laplacian minus D squared, instead of 1 over C squared, D squared, DT squared, I'm going to call this the uh, D squared, D tau squared. And this is a different tau, I'm sorry. Yet another meaning for tau. Where tau, you might have seen something like this in special relativity. It's C times T. So we've taken time and be, we've put it on equal footing with spatial dimensions, right? C times T it has dimensions of length, just like X or Y or Z, right? And, right, so, um, yeah, yeah, a little bit of a uh, digression. Special relativity. Right. Um, we talk about things and we express them in terms of what are known as four vectors. Did any of you see this in fun two? I suspect not. So we can write our coordinate and I'm gonna write this Sorry. And this, I'm going to write it as a vector with four components, tau, and then I'm going to call it x right there. Why is that four components? Because really this is c, t, x, y, Z, right? That's, we'll label them X0, X1, X2, and X3, right? So the zeroth component is temporal. Um, and this is, this is one way to write, oh, it, write it. And so um, I should have, I'm sorry. Let me do one thing right here. Erp. This isn't to the first power. This is where I'm placing my labels. Nope. It's a two. There's my three. Right. Um, so this is known as the covariant way to write it. And write mu is equal to zero, one, two, three. Right. Um, so, all right, that's fine. That looks a little bit familiar though, right? In electricity magnetism, right, we can use a four vector to write out a four potential. And why are we talking about special relativity all of a sudden, right? We've got all this stuff with C's involved, right? And we looked at how these effects are propagating outwards at the speed of light. So I can write A mu. So there's an, another form of these things called a contravariant form where the, the index goes in the bottom um, here. I'll actually just do this here let me finish this slot then i'll write out the contravariant form All right so this is going to be v over c a right which i could write out as v over c a x a y a z 
right? And that's it's not an exponent; it's an index. And I'll show you an an analog right there. It's not an exponent. Ah, yeah. Why is it up above? And that's a three. We could have x sub mu, which would be um, minus tau, then the spatial coordinates. Right? So there's that minus sign. So when we take dot products, we end up with uh, the, you end up with x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c squared t squared. Oh, accident. Um, all right, and where am I going with this? So then we can take this and we can rewrite our Lorentz gauge conditions. Um, right, so we'll take divergence of A equals minus mu epsilon naught dv dt, right? Um, here, I'm going to write this as divergence of A plus mu naught epsilon naught dv dt equals zero. Right. And then I can write that. I'm going to take the second derivative and write it first. The that becomes one over c squared, right? Dv dt plus divergence of a equals zero. Um, and that in turn I can write this as uh, well. I could absorb the C in, into the T and make that into a tau, and then I still have one factor of one over C. This becomes D V over C D tau plus divergence of A equals zero, which I can write D sub mu a sub mu equals zero in what's called Einstein notation. So the D sub mu means D dx sub mu. So that's take the derivative with respect to either x0, x1, x2. And anytime you have a, a repeated index, it means you sum over that. So that is beautifully compact, right? It's just like two symbols with, with each with an index equals a zero. And we've summed up what this thing is right here. Um, and there's more with that. Notice we haven't talked about our sources yet. Let me take a picture of this. Okay, so in addition, right, we can write out a four current, whoops. I'm gonna write this as J, that's a J mu, right? It's equal to rho C times J. 
the vector, right? Which we could write as rho c j sub x, j sub y, j sub z. Right, and so then our continuity equation is super simple. Asian, um, it just becomes, again, there's there's a temporal derivative of rho is equal to negative divergence of j. And I can write that out though this way. That is beautiful. Right. This is d rho d t minus, sorry, d rho d t divergence of j is equal to zero. Just two symbols. It is. It's. I'm not expecting you to be like following it, following it, but that it is. It is beautifully elegant. Right. Um. Ah, let's write out Maxwell's equations. In the Lorentz gauge. Right, where we're working with the Delambertian gauge. Right, so with four vectors. Oops. Um, right, we have second derivatives. So it's going to be a product of our co contra and covariant derivatives summing over where the mu's are the same and then taking the nu is a separate independent index but it too is repeated oops that's supposed to be new like that so again we're relating second derivatives of one component of a to the same component of j. So you could have, for example, the zeroth component has to do with our rows, and the zeroth component of a is v. And then you've got the one, two, and three components of a, which are, are the vector potential a, and the one, two, three components of j, which are the current density. Whew, right, so all that right there, right, th this is, Right, that is a beautifully compact way to write out this set of equations. And minus del squared A plus one over C squared D squared A t squared equals mu naught j, right? That one very short line was equivalent to those two much more complicated lines. Um, so why is, it, why is this thing here useful? Look at this, another <laughs> Oops, no, oh, wait, 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 I blew the whole thing. Nope. So two different people. The Lorenz gauge is Lorentz invariant. Um, means it doesn't change as you move to different, uh, to, to different reference frames at moving at constant velocity with respect to each other. So um, it's used in quantum electrodynamics and particle physics, right? Anything where we've got lots of relativity involved. Um, but it's incomplete. The potentials aren't fully specified, so there's still degrees of freedom.
and you get boundary conditions at on the light cone of the experiment. So there are other types of gauges. Um, all right, so that's one, and so so in that case, your level only comes from DADT, right? Uh, there's a multipolar gauge, which is a crazy one. Where R dot A is equal to zero. Um, anyways, the advantage there is it produces uh, simple ways oops no I'm sorry to get a and V from e and a so right we're set up to get I'm um, from e and B we're set up to get the fields from the potential, but the multipolar gauge is easier to get the potentials from the fields. <laughs> Again, fire hose, don't need to re retain any of this, just retain like, whoa, there's all kinds of wild stuff going on. That's what I want to do. I know I'm like just short of I'm time. Would you be okay if I went a tiny bit over? Not just a tiny bit, a few minutes over. It's a no problem. I don't know if it was universal to everyone. I'm going to try not to go too, too long. That's fine. OK, um, just because it's kind of exciting. Um, so what I want to do is, is talk about, again, why did I try to cram all this stuff right in um, is, is partly that um, all this stuff right here is a model for other field theories. So again. Um, I'll write this. And especially quantum field theories. Um, so it turns out in particle physics, quantum field theories are theories where we describe particles and the interactions between them uh, with fields of particles. What? Because the fields that exert the forces are themselves quantized. Right, so we have what's called the Lagrangian, and that's how we describe the physics. It is it's written as T plus V. Um, this is kinetic energy, and that's potential energy. Um, it doesn't change. as you make transformations. So if you make a certain transformations and you're still within the set of allowed, you know, you haven't changed things, the set of allowed transformations called a Lie group Not lie, Lee, another French guy. Right, this is abstract algebra. Not necessarily the what you spend all that much on um, in uh, 
in your algebra class courses here because th these are continuous rather than discrete transformations. Um, and so we've got these extra degrees of freedom in that, that you can make changes and it doesn't change anything. Um, so we can apply these restrictions. And so the restriction is called the gauge, right? The same way we had like our Coulomb gauge, the restriction was the divergence of A was equal to zero. Or the Lorentz gauge, where the divergence of A was equal to minus mu naught epsilon naught dA dt. Right. Um, and transformations, uh, I'm sorry, it was the transformation between gauges, what forms the Lie, Lie group, or a symmetry group, or a gauge group, right? Between gauges. Right, also called symmetry group or a gauge group. Cool. Um, and so the group has generators. And those are elements from which the other elements can be formed. And every generator has a field associated with it called a gauge field. We're gonna come back to what this tells us about particle physics in a second, every generator. Um, and then one of the things in quantum field theory is that every field can be quant is quantized. So it only comes in discrete amounts. You can have zero or one or two or three. And those quanta are called gauge bosons. They're kind of particle. Right, anything that comes in discrete amounts, that's a particle. Um, and these are the force carriers. The gauge bosons. So the <clears throat> quantization of the generator field. Um, so here. So quantum electrodynamics, so electricity, magnetism, but quantized. The symmetry group is called U1. Basically, you can add a phase on to, to, to everything and it doesn't change anything. There's one degree of freedom. So there's one gauge field. And that gauge field has a gauge boson called, what's the force carrier for electricity and magnetism? Photon. So we talk about photons being particles of light, but the light carries momentum. And the momentum, right, absorption and emission uh, of the photon will, will cause change in momentum. That's a with, right? Um, the weak force is 
the symmetry group is the special unitary tube. So that has three gauge fields. So, so three gauge bosons. And the, the force carriers are the W plus particle, the W minus particle, and the Z zero particle, right? You look at your particle physics, chart of different particles. These are the force carriers for the weak force. Quantum dynamics, right? This is the strong force. Its symmetry group is SU3. It has eight gauge fields in bosons. And these are the eight types of gluons. So what we've been doing here is forms kind of a model for more complicated versions, but the same kind of thing going on forms the basis, this idea of, of the fact that this, we don't have a one-to-one -one relationship, we have freedom and we can make, and restrictions on those freedoms are related to each other by symmetries. And those symmetries then mathematically correspond to these fields and hence these particles that carry the forces. So, yeah, we started out with ENM. ENM was kind of hard, but it is not just useful technologically. It was a model for so much more of physics. And that makes a nice connection kind of saying, hey, you know, maybe you I'm sure you didn't get this all. I don't necessarily, I didn't get this all. And I've, um, but it's a really good appetizer for all kinds of really cool stuff you can do with this. Okay, I am totally over time, but I, I kind of, that's a nice, I, I think that's kind of a nice way to, to wrap it up and lay the foundation for like, hey, this is, opens the door to a whole world of really cool physics. So anyways, um, I know I'm like nine minutes, 10 minutes over already. Um, thank you everyone for being patient with me. Um, yeah, good luck on finals. Have as good of a summer as you can. Um, I'll be still be in touch. If you've got questions on your homework, questions on the final, I'm always here. Um, I will want to hear from you about all these things. Awesome, cool. Thanks everyone. I'll be getting back in touch with about everything. See y'all. Take care. I'm going to head out.